We thank everybody for showing up today. Uh, we really appreciate the turnout and, and the interest. I think you'll really enjoy today's program and stuff. Um, on behalf of Chapman Hex, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm Greg Hex. I'm one of the original founders and CEO of Chapman Hex and Wirework Advisors. We are a full financial services firm, and what we mean by that is we basically our job is to take care of the financial affairs of our clients, from tax, financial reporting, compliance work, investment banking, wealth management, and for the business owner, it's to walk through all those different processes. We're always looking for clients, we're always looking for problems to solve, so if we can help you or any of your clients, please don't hesitate to ask, and we'll be glad to help you or point you in the right direction. Um, the um, couple, just kind of call it homework type items. There's a CPE evaluation form. If you would like to get CPE credit today, that sitting should be in your chair. If you'll fill it out and return it at the registration desk out front, we'll get that done for you and make sure you get credit and you can stick to that. Um, there's also a speaker evaluation form. If you'll please fill that out and do the same and return it. That'll be great. Um, and then we're also looking for topics, just um, some information. We'll talk a little bit at the end about what all we're going to be doing over the next few months and things that are coming up in the fall. We're busy lining up speakers and topics. I think you'll uh, find them as engaging as, as you will today and really interesting stuff. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I want to first introduce you to Jim Winpress. Um, Jim is the president and CEO of Big Brothers, Big Sisters International. Um, we're going to give him a few minutes to talk about Big Brothers Big Sisters and the wonderful things they're doing in the community. As most of you know, one of the things we do is we like to make sure and highlight um, for um, some type of nonprofit philanthropy type uh, entity so they can talk just a few minutes and it's a good chance for you guys to get exposed. So we'll let Jim take the floor. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. That's that slide again. Maybe it doesn't. Uh, uh, well, thank you all. Uh, I appreciate being here. I want to thank uh, Greg and Andrea and Calvin for making this possible. And uh, I guess Julio for giving me uh, three or four or five minutes of your time. Uh, he's a much better speaker than I am. But I have a great message. Uh, my message is um, helping kids. Um, Big Brothers Big Sisters uh, has been around uh, since uh, 1904. Started in New York City. Um, in uh, 1998, the organization moved to Philadelphia. And in 2001, it moved to Las Colinas. Um, International was formed in 1998. Uh, interesting, that was the same year that I moved to Texas from New York. Um, our vision is that all children achieve success in life. It's a very noble cause. Our mission is to provide kids with those facing adversity with strong, enduring, professionally supported one-on-one -on -one relationships that changes their life for the better forever. Now, that's a pretty bold uh, mission. What does it take to do that? It takes a lot of uh, great people that give their time as mentors uh, for these children. Um, but a couple of uh, kind of facts from these children, what they've told us. We've surveyed them, 90% feel better about themselves. You want to be successful in life, feeling good about yourself is a great start. Um, so we provide that for them. How do we do that? We listen to them. We build a relationship with them and we start to uh, enable them to think about a future better than maybe where their present is. Uh, Boston Consulting Group, uh, I'm sure this group has probably heard of them. Um, they did a study for us in Toronto, Canada, one of the 13 countries that we're in. Um, and they, they came back and said for every dollar invested, there's an $18 return, social return for that investment. Uh, kind of makes sense. It's much easier to spend uh, uh, 100 to to $1,000 on a child at a young age than it is to incarcerate them later in life or, God forbid, worse things. Um, so how do I know this is a great investment, me personally? Well, I've been with the organization since last June. And I want to tell you about two people that are involved in the organization. The first one is, uh, I'll, they're, they're very humble guys, so I'll just use their first names. One is Tracy, 
So Tracy, by his own description, was kind of a messed up kid. Um, but he's not a messed up adult. And the reason he's not is he was a little, uh, which we call the children that we mentor, um, he had a great mentor. In fact, he still has a great relationship, and I'm guessing Tracy is probably in his 50s now. Um, but Tracy also serves on the board of his community on the Big Brothers Big Sisters, in addition to being the board chair for Big Brothers Big Sisters International. So, kind of a success story, but most exciting to me is the fact that those that receive the benefit are excited about now giving back after receiving the benefit. That's pretty powerful. I, I, like, I like the culture that that builds. Our, our other person, Brian, um, was a little, uh, grew up in Texas, um, same kind of situation, Le needed guidance, needed some help, uh, uh, ends up going to uh, a well-known school on a, on a scholarship, uh, then gets into real estate in Europe, does really well, um, now is involved as a trustee at the college where he received the scholarship. But what's really cool to me is that he's currently in Poland, which is now kind of his adopted second home, and he uh, founded uh, our affiliate chapter in Poland. So now he is not only running that among his other charities and still, as he told me, I'm not quite being able to pull out of my business, um, but he founded the chapter in Poland, and based in Warsaw, and he's serving over 500 children and making a difference in their lives. So, again, I'm Jim Wimpress. I'm with Big Brothers Big Sisters International. Uh, our overhead costs for administering our, our services, supporting these affiliates throughout the world, is about five bucks a kid. Um, the country's cost is about $500 to maybe $900 a child. The cost for Big Brothers Big Sisters locally is probably about anywhere from $1,100 to $1,500. Uh, so um, I guess my final pitch to you is if you have time, if you have money, if you have introductions or resources, I would love <coughs> you to talk to me. Um, I'll leave you with a quote that's on this card, which just so happens to have a way to write down your name and, uh, or if you want to write down a, a donation, whatever you want to do. But um, the best quote ever is, my mom taught me how to survive. My big sister taught me how to thrive. I was fortunate to have a big sister, but my big sister was five years older and already in my family. But I, I know what she did for me, and I know that these kids really benefit from having some some adult in their life that can guide them towards a better future. So I thank you for your time. I look forward to anyone uh, that wants to slip me a business card, I'll follow up on it. Um, but we need uh, people that want to get involved and help, whether it's locally, I'll give a pitch for the local group, but I'm an international guy, and I, I would love to have people on our, uh, consider being on our board, be, uh, being uh, introducing me to businesses that are in the area, or if you just want to give me cash. Cash still works in this world. <laughs> well, am I right on that? I'm right on it. Okay, I just wanted to check. All right, so with that, thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks so much, thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Julio Gonzalez is our speaker today. Julio is the founder and CEO of Engineering Tax Services. Um, his focus is bringing specialized engineering tax studies to mainstream America which historically hadn't been available except to maybe the Fortune 500 companies throughout the, the big national, you know, big four national accounting firms and stuff. He works weekly in Washington, D.C. to work on advice on tax reform and is the go-to expert representing Hispanic 100, Hispanic Council, and family offices. Today, he's going to present and talk to us about introductory and advanced strategies for opportunity zone investing. We're delighted to have you. Thank you so much. Appreciate yeah. it. All right. Well, it's, it's good to be in a friendly state. There we go. I got it up there. I like being in Texas. And, and by the way, Jim, you know, the, if you take cash, 60% uh, charitable contribution tax 
benefit, right? So, uh, so you do get some benefit there, Jim, right? Well, listen, uh, it's really an honor to be here in Texas. Uh, you know, it's good to uh, get a few days away from D.C. And uh, I'm up there routinely working on tax reform, tax policy. We're working on extensions now. Extenders that haven't been extended for a few years. We're working on technical corrections. We're working on other things up there that, you know, when you change the uh, tax code every 30 years, you make, uh, you realize that after f the first few months, you have to uh, make some changes and fixes. And, you know, tax reform shouldn't be every uh, 30 years. It should be more annually so that we're fine tuning the economy as we go. But again, it's great to be here. I was in California last week. They weren't so as friendly, but um, anyway, listen, my background is, you know, back in the uh, 80s, we were the, the big eight accounting firms, and we did specialty tax credits. We did that for the, uh, really, the Fortune 500 companies, the public companies. And in 2000, I decided that, you know, uh, these tax credits should be mainstream and that everyone in the United States that's in real estate and manufacturing energy should have access to these credits. And so that was really our goal was to be a resource to the CPA community and to the uh, United States of America and make sure that everyone had access to these real estate credits, manufacturing credits. And, and today we have over 100 people, 26 offices across the country. And a couple years ago, Vice President Pence asked me to come on to the Private Tax Council and help oversee tax reform. So, uh, you know, we didn't get health care done, and uh, that was uh, pretty uh, alarming, and we were concerned we wouldn't get tax reform done. And it really came down to one vote at the very end, the last day. It took a lot of uh, maneuvering over uh, a year to get it done, a lot of... Uh, lobbying and things but i'll tell you in um, tax reform congress you know the house writes the tax reform bill and passes it and then it goes to the senate they pass it make corrections then it comes back to the house and then ultimately the president signs off well that's tough to get done we didn't get it done in health care uh, and again it was very difficult when ryan and brady from here uh, you know here you got great people here in texas drafted the tax bill you know, there was no chance that the original draft was going to get passed. So we had to do a lot of, uh, I guess, negotiating to, uh, and lobbying and a lot of, uh, a lot of time and effort to uh, ultimately get a tax reform bill done that could get passed. And really the goal was to lower the income tax rates for the corporations. I think that was the impetus for tax reform one and hoping that tax reform 2.0 would follow after quickly for the income tax rates for individuals. But um, that being said, Opportunity Zones was never in the uh, draft of tax reform. It wasn't in the first blueprint. It wasn't in the second blueprint. It wasn't in the third blueprint. Um, but what happened, and it came in at the very end, was that we had Charlottesville, if you guys remember Charlottesville. and. Um, you know, they were having quite a disaster there at the White House with some of the comments that were made. And uh, President Trump asked Senator Scott to come in from uh, the Carolinas and see if he couldn't help out with Charlottesville and uh, get a message out to the uh, United States to kind of uh, settle that issue down. And uh, so Senator Scott came in, kind of uh, saved the day there at the White House. And uh, President Trump asked if he could do anything for Senator Scott. And Senator Scott said he'd been working on this draft, the Opportunity Zone, which really was um, an involvement of the Empowerment Zone and the Enterprise Zones. And we'll talk about that in a second. But um, basically, President Trump looked at it. The uh, Opportunity Zone was, really came out of the uh, chairman from uh, the executives from Napster and ultimately into Microsoft that came up with a concept and was working with Senator Scott to get that done. So that's how it came about. Charlottesville came about. President Trump looked at it and then asked at the very end to put it into uh, the uh, tax reform bill. So it wasn't even scored. It was 
kind of a miracle that it got in at the very end. Um, so, but it did get in, and uh, I think it's created a lot of uh, excitement. The reason I wanted to talk about it is because it really was an extension of uh, Jack Kemp's legacy. When uh, Jack Kemp was at HUD, he had done the Enterprise Zones, and previous to that, the Empowerment Zones. And uh, really, that, those tax codes, which are still around today, was really stimulus to bring money into these communities that needed help. And, uh, you know, they were work, labor, credits, things of that nature. Didn't really work. We didn't have a lot of success with it. So Opportunity Zones was drafted to, you know, supercharge these enterprise empowerment zones and basically give them legs. And basically, by creating a way that we could defer capital gains, give some forgiveness, and ultimately uh, eliminate capital gains with a once once in a lifetime opportunity. And uh, so I think the excitement of the Opportunity Zones, and again, we're still working on comments every week. We're still working with Treasury. We're still working with the IRS. And, um, but you know, we, we know pretty much the structure of what the Opportunity Zones will be. But I wanted to share that with you because I think the one thing I see when I go across the country and talk about Opportunity Zones is that people, I think, know the architecture today as it stands in the bill. And, uh, but I'm going to show you something here. You know, I, I'm doing a project in uh, St. Louis. And if you look at this, um, we have Opportunity Zone. So this building's in an Opportunity Zone, right? So I'm going to get the capital gains benefits from going into this project, right? But I just want you to know that if you're in an Opportunity Zone, and we're, we're going to get into the details of the opportunity zones, but I just want to make sure that you guys are aware of something. When you go into an opportunity zone, it's already probably been an enterprise zone, it's been an empowerment zone, it may be in a historical zone. So if you look at this slide, you know, I'm buying this building, right, for roughly uh, $10 million, right? And I'm going to get the benefit of bringing my gains into this property and defer them discount them, and then ultimately have no gains on this, this asset, right? But this building is also historic tax credit, federal and state. So I'm gonna get 25 to 30% of my equity from the historic tax credits because most buildings in these opportunity zones are gonna be well over 50 years old, right? I'm gonna get new market tax credits for creating employment within the structure. I'm gonna get brownfield credits for cleaning up the building. I also negotiated lost development rights, so I'm going to give up 10 stories of air rights and donate that to the city and sell those for credits. We're taking solar credits, we're taking facade easement credits as well to restore the facade of the building. We're taking cell tower income, property tax abatement. I negotiated 10 years of property tax abatement. I'm also getting TIFs, which is sales tax for 10 years. I'm taking design and energy efficient <coughs> tax credits and solve credits. So I want to say this, because I think this slide's important, that when you go into an opportunity zone, the reason we needed an opportunity zone was because we, we want businesses to come into and uh, reestablish these communities. But the enterprise zones and empowerment zones weren't working, right? They weren't bringing business into these communities because we're, there was no infrastructure, right? There was no buildings and technology for these people to move into, right? And that's the big thing about Opportunity Zones. Once, you know, bringing the buildings and the infrastructure and then also bringing in business. So, but what I, you know, the billionaire clients that we work with in real estate, they always use all these credits. They maximize everything. They negotiate with the state, the government, the city. They don't sign that contract and buy that building until they've gotten 30 to 50% of the equity from these credits that they can sell off. So I think it's an important point. I'm sure Greg and his team can do a much better job of walking you through those steps here locally. But uh, I think this is an important slide. I wanted to say that because really the... Uh, the whole thing with Opportunity Zones is we got to get the infrastructure into these communities so that the businesses can come in as well. And that really is the goal. 
And um, I want to say this as well. So again, you know, I'm in the White House routinely. If any of you would ever like to come visit the White House, you know, give me 10 days notice and I'll be happy to uh, take you through the visit of the White House and uh, be my guest up there in DC. Um, but, and, and, and really give you a, an understanding of how things work at the Capitol Hill and Congress and the halls of Congress and the halls of Senate. But we're working on weekly finalizing the Opportunity Zone uh, rules, the tax rules. Uh, I will send you guys r weekly updates to that because I know you guys have a lot of questions, whether it's the, uh, the uh, partnership rights, the land rights, things of that nature. Um, so I will be happy to uh, continue to update you and Greg and through Greg routinely on any updates, anything that we're submitting. And if you have comments that you'd like to have submitted to Congress and to Treasury on this, because uh, I would imagine we'll have everything finalized uh, by June or July. I think that's the uh, appropriate time, unless we have some other big issue come up there that distracts uh, the members up there. But hopefully, I think we're on time for that. And um, with that, um, I just want to introduce our team here John and Mike, and uh, they're really the experts at this, uh, the technical architecture of opportunity zones and what the benefits are. And they, they work in it every day, working with uh, real estate, working with businesses going into these, uh, and they're a big, great technical resource. But again, I'll be here at the end, and, uh, and then you'll see, you can see me on Fox and Family Friends routinely, and uh, you can always always see me getting beat up on CNN and MSNBC where they <laughs> routinely beat me up. Um, but ultimately, I think this Opportunity Zone program is just amazing. And again, I see that what Mike and John are going to share with you, I see that around the country. But what I don't ever see are people talking about the credits and tax benefits that have already been in these communities that you can use to really create icing on the cake. So with that, I'll let Mike uh, come in and take over on some of the technical aspects with John. Thanks, Mike. And, and you can wait a second if you yeah, want. Yeah, yeah, you got it. We, we believe in the team approach. That's why uh, we, we're gonna do a little tag team uh, presentation style this morning. And, and it is informal, so you know if you wanna finish your breakfast or, uh, or, or uh, ask questions along the way, let's, let's keep it interactive. Um, and uh, I also want to introduce Dave Ramsey, who, who is here in, in Dallas, uh, our, our local team member. So we are a national firm, um, and I want to say thank you to Julio. He's a great friend. We've worked together for 10 plus years, um, and, and he's done amazing things behind the scenes, you know, for, for our families, you know, with, with tax policy and, and other things that a lot of people don't realize what goes on in Washington. Um, He's not kidding on the White, White House visits and, and other things. Uh, I'm there with my family for spring break in, in, in two weeks, and we're, we're visiting the White House. Uh, so there's some amazing things that we have access to, and if we can help companies, well, one thing he didn't mention is you know, helping companies to you know, stack all these opportunities, you know, whether it's real estate or a company or a business or an emerging idea or technology, um, to get access you know, at the highest levels, whether it's in Washington or your state, or wherever the state or, or, or local municipality is, Julio and our team have some amazing connections, you know, to, to help get you a voice, you know, to ask the questions. Because um, maybe some of the largest real estate and investment firms that we work with are routinely familiar with how to stack some of these opportunities together, but I, 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 you probably are not. So that, that's where we can help. Um, so I'm going to get a little bit more technical in the opportunity zone overview, but also to back up a little bit and tell you a little bit of more about where that came from in tax reform so you can see how it all ties together. And then John is going to give us a little bit of the um, kind of real world examples of what we're seeing out there, uh, actual actual companies, actual real estate projects, um, some right around the corner. And this is a version of a, of a presentation that we use, and you'll have access to this, we'll give it to the team. To distribute out. And actually, there's a whole another presentation that we have that is, um, you know, very tax technical uh, on the one hand, and then the other one is very technical on the opportunity zone uh, side. So we're not going to get into extremely technical par parts of the opportunity zone. 
Uh, but we'll give you those presentations so you can you can read through it, and of course we'll be available locally or nationally to you know to to get into the details on your specific situation. Um, again, just a little bit of background on ETS. Uh, Julio started the firm, does an amazing job. You know, also works with our investment clients, our national family offices and investment groups, and you know real estate side of things. I'm more the the, the technical side of things, the the, the services side. Um, specialty tax, energy, uh, investments, um, anything that we can layer together. Um, and again, Dave, Dave is here locally. But again, this, this is the, I'm going to do the quick version of kind of what happened in tax reform and how did we get to the opportunity zone because you, you need to understand some of the basics <laughs> of depreciation and, and incentives and credits um, because not, not all folks do. Uh, the biggest questions going into the elections um, and coming out in 2018 and where we are now was what was going to happen to carried interest, the mortgage interest deduction, the ability to deduct state and local taxes, which is having huge impacts on states like New York. We were talking about that last night. Um, immediate expensing over longer term depreciation, you know, your, your 39 year, your 27 and a half year schedule. What was going to happen to 1031 exchanges? What was going to happen to AMT? For those of you who make enough money to know what alternative minimum tax is, so the good the good news for for real estate and for businesses, but quickly I'm going to focus on the real estate aspects of the tax law. The good thing is 1031 uh, for the most part was was kept the same, uh, so it was extended. Uh, the only technical change that they made to 1031 exchanges was that um, you can't you're not supposed to exchange all property, so tangible personal property within a 1031 exchange. Is supposed to be excluded, and that's okay. You know, that's the, 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 the some of the fixtures and furnishings and and, and equipment, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, but overall, 1031 stays in, intact, and that's good. Uh, deductibility of business interest or your loan uh, on that property, you can still write that off as well. Uh, there is a slight give back if you decide to do that. Your depreciation class lives on your building goes up slightly. Uh, so I think it's fair. We won't get into too much technicality of that. Depreciation overall stays the same. If it's a commercial building, it's de it's depreciated at 39 years. If it's residential or multifamily apartment building, as an example, it's 27 and a half years. Um, unless you elected to, to, to write off that, that interest, then it goes to 30 and 40 years. But you can still cost segregate all that, which is the, the new thing that everyone's doing to capture that um, you know, to carve out the, the personal property from the real property. Um, the biggest thing that, that happened in tax reform besides opportunity zones, which we're going to talk about in detail in a second, is, is that new 100% bonus depreciation. Um, and a lot of folks don't realize what, what that means, but bonus depreciation has been around for a while. Uh, traditionally, it was for, it applied to construction of new property or additions to, or renovations to existing buildings. And it was the IRS's uh, uh, way of giving you a bonus, you know, to put new new stuff into service, uh, so you could write it off quicker. Um, but what the new, and I'm giving you the non-tax technical version of that. But what bonus depreciation now also applies to is purchases of existing buildings, and you'll see how this ties into opportunity zone investing uh, as well, because it's, it's very powerful. And it was one of the couple line items in, in Julio's slide there of how to stack things together. So now you can you can purchase a building, uh, you can carve out the personal property from the real property, which is about 25% of, you know, 30, 25 to 30% of most buildings, um, and you can have an immediate um, write-off of that. that. That's what 100% bonus depreciation means. 100% of the personal property in the building we can write off immediately. Uh, so just round numbers, $10 million building, that means about $2.5 million of that is personal property that can be written off immediately. So that's um, a, a way to offset some of your um, risk in that property. Um, also, there's the new section 179, again, not to get too tech technical, but they added uh, roofs and HVAC systems, uh, which is a primary cost driver for improvements uh, that you can write off up to a million bucks. Uh, so, so those are some huge things in tax reform that happen for property owners that I teach all the time um, with, with our CPA experts that a lot of folks don't realize. And 
many folks didn't know why maybe someone was paying a certain price for a property that maybe didn't maybe seems a little high or out of whack. Um, but now, because of, their, because of what they're stacking in there in terms of the incentives, um, uh, that's why their return model might be a lot different than what you're used to. Other things that we see people doing in, in buildings um, and missing all the time, in addition to uh, you know, the opportunity zone, is you know, before you buy, before you build, before you renovate, um, we can do all of this stuff. We can model it all out. Do those energy and efficiency studies. They're still uh, sometimes paid for by the local utilities, paid for by the states, or um, you know, there's still you know, Fannie and Freddie loan discounts that you can get if your building's green certified. Um, abandonment and disposition. Um, again, there's a very tax technical part of that, but think of the stuff that gets, <coughs> excuse me, that gets removed out of the building when you do an improvement. Um, when you go to Goodwill and you drop off a bag of clothes, what do they hand you? A receipt. Same thing we do, and it's the IRS prefers it. I mean, it's, it's showing them that you're being accurate with, with what's in that building and what's not. Um, so when you go in and you replace countertops, cabinets, flooring, uh, whatever, anything that comes out of that property uh, has a value and, and can be written off immediately as long as we can identify it. Um, it's missed all the time. Uh, so that's, that's one of the reasons that we're an engineering and specialty tax firm, so we can understand what's going on uh, within that building. Was that, uh, was that the abandonment and disposition, <coughs> as you said? Correct. Yeah, and I use those terms interchangeably. Sometimes the CPAs will technically call that pad or partial asset disposition or abandonment. So again, anytime something gets taken out of a property, that $10 million property that Julio mentioned, if he's going to do you know two or $3 million worth of improvements, um, everything that comes out of that building had a value as it ties back to that original $10 million purchase. So the old floors, the old, the old every, anything that comes out, always think of that goodwill example. You know, yes. Okay, so we just bought seventy-five million dollars of apartments in the city, mm -hmm. and we're doing a renovation. Yeah, so you're doing a value add play on there. You're doing the you're unit improvements. Right. So, is that so what, what's the cost of the renovation that you're doing? Pardon? What's the cost of the renovation that you're just on average? Oh, I don't know about uh, twelve million. Okay. So just in your head, about 25 to 50 percent of that is disposition credits that we could probably get for you. Okay, so if we've already started the process, is it still available? Absolutely. Yeah, it's optimal to start you know, to, to, to work proactively, but many times, I mean, we're working with clients that have uh, had, had done that to properties 10 years ago, and we can still go back retroactively uh, and, and capture those benefits. So yeah, we just need an overview of property address, description, purchase price and date, and if you got an improvements or CapEx plan, just an overview of that, and then we can always run the numbers um, and, and give you an estimate of what the benefits are. We do that hundreds of times a, a month, and, uh, and Dave can help you with that. I mean, that's, that's what we do. There's a, there's a video here, which isn't gonna play, I mean, it is gonna play, but you're not gonna hear it due to technical difficulties with the way this is all wired. Uh, but it's, it's really cool, and it's on our website. It kind of explains how we s see what's in a building. And this is imp important for an opportunity zone project, and, and John will tell you why in a second, because if we don't identify the costs of the improvements, the cost of the renovations, you're not gonna qualify for the second part of the requirement of an opportunity zone, which is uh, you, you must do a substantial improvement of that property. Yeah, that's kind of crazy. Yeah. How do you 100%? Well, there's a lot of ways that you can do 100%. So that's a good question. Um, so I'll get to the opportunity zone portion of this, but there, there's 30 other slides here on the tax strategies, you know, in advanced real estate stuff. That's perfect for, for your, your project. This is an overview of some of the energy incentives. And again, I'm going quickly because I'll be respectful of everyone's time. Um, some of the energy incentives, Julio mentioned the word tax extenders that they're working on. <clears throat> there's yearly, or sometimes every two years, tax bill that needs to be um, extended. Uh, one of them is 179D, that's for energy efficient windows and uh, roofs and an envelope. Another one is called 45L, that's you get a $2,000 tax credit per unit if it's residential. I don't know if you knew about that one. We can go back last three years and get you 2,000 per unit. Uh, you do the math on how many units you got. Um, but, but that's where we, uh, Specialized, all federal, state, local, all the way down to the utility level. How do we stack it all together? I'm getting over to the opportunity zone portion. Uh, 
got lots of good case studies of different buildings and projects that we're working on. <coughs> Here's an abandonment example. I mean, how many of you ever put new lights or a new roof or new HVAC system or anything? You know, here's a lighting system that was replaced in a building. Everyone forgot that the old lighting system had value. You know, okay. Um, so we we identify it. You know, in this example, that's you know that's about a you know, fifty fifty nine thousand uh, dollar abandonment uh, write off. You know, plus the tax incentive on the new lights that came in. So that's how you stack some of this stuff together. It works really well. Um, so so onto opportunity zones. But now it's important. That you understand a little bit of the background of, of how you know the when I say the <clears throat> depreciation or a deduction or a credit, um, you know a little bit about that. John's going to give you an overview of some real world examples of what what we're doing out there. There's some. This is a really good slide that that shows the, the kind of typical opportunity zone snapshot. Um, investor has a, a cap gain, and that's the cool thing about opportunity zones as opposed to 1031. I explain to folks, because every time people ask me, like, well, what is this opportunity zone? It may not be technically correct, but I say think about a combination of a 1031 exchange on the front end and a Roth IRA on the back end. Because to me, in my brain, that, that's, that's what an opportunity zone project is, either for a property or for a company. It's the opportunity for tax deferral and reduction on the front end, like a 1031. Um, and on the back end, you know, the potential appreciation of that building or company, which John's going to talk about as well, is potentially tax-free completely after 10 years. Um, so investor sells stock, um, and again, different from 1031, it could be any kind of cap gain. In 1031, it has to be like for like. So you sell real estate, you've got to go into real estate of like kind. But this is different. You sell your vintage Ferrari or your art or a company or anything and you have a cap gain, it can go into an opportunity zone fund. Have to do it within 180 days is the timeline. And there's some things that they're working out with that, but for now let's go with 180 days from the date that that cap gain event happened. Um, that then gets placed into a qualified opportunity zone fund, which that word fund is, is very um, confusing to some folks. Because typically when I say fund, you're thinking about a, uh, a, a larger investment vehicle that might be an aggregate of people and uh, opportunities within a fund. Um, that, that's not what is technically meant here for opportunity zones. It could be a single asset, one building, one company, one property, one investor, or it could be multiple. Uh, but that term fund <coughs> is the way that they uh, describe it. Um, then there's the substantial improvement requirement that this gentleman was uh, asking about yes, sir. You have to have a qualified intermediary or something where that money goes. That's a good question. Uh, for 1031, yes. For uh, opportunity zone, no. The way the the law is written right now is it's it's a technically a self certification process. I, I I don't recommend you do it on your own. It's like yes, you can file your own taxes, but that's why you have great CPAs and, and specialists like us to to help with the with the qualification, with the certification, with the with the correct forms. Um, but there is no uh, independent, you know, intermediary uh, process like like 1031. Um, so, so John, I'm going to introduce John Mack, who's out of our Philly office, and uh, his specialty. He's a great guy as well, you know, friend and also colleague. But he's really smart when it comes to the the business strategies, the, the investment strategies, the the investment and the, and the fund management strategies. So he works behind the scenes with our family office and our capital markets team. So I'll introduce John Mack. If you got questions about tax, you know, specialty tax, you know, you got the tax team here that we're working with, but specialty tax on real estate, incentives, credits, rebates, all that kind of stuff, Dave and I are happy to help. Um, John. Thank you. I was hoping he would leave the Philly part out. I know I'm in Dallas, but that's okay. <laughs> all right. We had one good year. You've had four, right? Four great years. Uh, so I always try to start this with some simple questions. How many people here have heard about qualified opportunity zones prior to today? Okay, so a good percentage. How many are actively researching what a qualified opportunity zone is and if it makes investment sense for real estate and or business? Okay. How many people are actively engaged 
in qualified opportunity zone properties right now or a business? Okay, wow. how, how many have done a deal? All right, two, that's one more than the last time I was speaking. So this is brand new, and there's lots of nuance that still has to work out, to be worked out, as Julio and, and some of his colleagues are fine-tuning the rules and regs. So I just want to make a couple things clear. What did you say, the last tax code change was 30 years ago? The yeah. law can't change until the law changes. So it may be another 30 years before this thing is wiped out or adjusted. The rules and regs can change, but the law cannot without a tax code change. So it's very important to understand. This is as permanent as you're going to get. And the structure might change a little bit over the next several years, but the law is not going to change anytime soon. Okay? So uh, in terms of just the, the simple premise, I want to start with this right here. Okay, we've been in an 11-year bull market in equities and in real estate, okay? There's a lot of cap gains out there. Six trillion, six trillion is the estimate right now. So what do you do? When's the market going to turn? When's it going to crash again? What do you do with those cap gains? How do you make them liquid? How do you protect your assets? How do you mit minimize or mitigate some tax liability? Our premise is, is always starting here that if you take this cap gains and put it into a bad project because it's QOZ, you're going straight down there, okay? It's not going to make a bad project good. It's going to make a good project better. So there's some things here that we're fascinated by, and I want everybody really to just start thinking about this. So I'm going to ask a couple more questions. How many real estate investors? Okay. How many have assets that happen to be in QOZ that are real estate investors? Anybody? You just woke up one day and it's in a QOZ. Okay. Which has happened. It's, it's crazy. It's happened a lot. How many, um, I think there's a couple of folks here that M&A for small businesses, lower to middle market businesses. Right? You buy and sell companies, merge companies. Is anybody looking at putting those companies into QOZs? Okay, good. You're, you're way ahead of the curve. That's the part that really gets me excited. But we're going to just talk about the simple benefit. Again, major premise that we tell people. Somebody just brought up the question about self-certification. Don't do that. Don't do that. Do that and, and run 50 properties through TurboTax and see how, that, how you make out there. Find a good accountant. Find a good lawyer. Set up a fund. We're setting up funds on behalf of developers and business owners. And we're bringing in flight to quality team, KPMG in Philly, national QOZ practice leader, <coughs> Dwayne Morris in Philly, national QOZ practice leader. Because we want to be protected and want to represent the clients. And the, uh, the compliance is going to get tighter, not looser. It's already too loose and everybody's recognizing that. So it's going to get tighter as the years go on and as the rules and regs evolve. So we're treating it as institutional quality fund administration down to using SS and C Global Ops to do quarterly reporting back to the investors. Go ahead. So when you say it's loose now on the restrictions, so are they going to grandfather everything that's not clear now when they start tightening stuff up so is it better to get in now when it's well, loose? Well, I think it's better to get in now, but for some different reasons. Right now, what I mean by that is it technically could be, a fund is a misnomer. It could be a single member LLC that owns a property. You have to self-certify every six months so six months after you start the fund to the day, and then December 31st of that year, okay? What we believe is going to happen is, well, the self there's going to be a lot of fraud and abuse. The self-certification thing isn't working out. We've got to make the rules tighter. Annual reporting, there's one single page form for the IRS right now. We think that's going to change and grow a little bit. So we're just advising clients, cover yourselves cover your investors and make sure that you are running the fund like an institutional quality fund, even if it's single member LLC. God forbid something happens in seven years and the investor does not self-certify, they lose everything. And is it then going to mess the deal up because they've lost their benefit and now they want to take their cash out because they have to pay the tax, the next <coughs> annual filing. So we're just advising people to be cautious and protective, like the quality, Top law firm, top accounting firm, top 20% of the developers if you're in the real estate business. There's a lot of, uh, you know, tulip mania, Bitcoin mania out there. Everybody's a QOZ developer. No, they're not. If they didn't do a project before, they're going to fail and fail miserably. Stay away, run for the hills, 
find out who their team is behind the fund and go that route. So let's just talk about the simple benefits. And again, it, it, just to clarify, it has to be capital gains. Doesn't mean you can't have other cash equity in a deal or debt, but the QOZ fund has to be 100% capital gains. And if it goes in as short term, it comes out as short term. If it goes in as long term, it comes out as long term, 10 plus years down the road, okay? So real estate, you put 10 million, you buy a, a piece of land or property for 10 million, you have to put another 10 million in improvement. So it's a simple one-to-one. -one. Ground up construction, it's easy to get over that threshold, okay? Year five, so you hold it for five years, you get a 10% step up in basis. So on 10 million in cap gains, you now only pay tax on nine, or yeah, nine million, right? after five years. So you've already eliminated permanently 10% of your tax base. However, you which also- Which you can't do in 1031. Which you can't do in 1031. You also defer paying tax, tax through December 31st, 2026. So you can pay them tomorrow, but you can wait seven years, eight months, and 26 days, or whatever it is from now. You can, you can still wait that amount of time to pay the tax, which you're gonna have to pay. After seven years, you get another 5% step up in basis, so that 10 million number, you only pay cap gains tax on eight and a half. The risk is, what's the cap gains rate gonna be at that time? Again, it's 23 and a half. It's probably gonna stay at or near there, who knows? We'll see who's in office in two years, and six years, and, and we'll see if there's any adjustments here, okay? But that is a huge benefit. It's gone forever. You don't have to pay cap gains tax on that top 15% of your 10 million. Again, this is when the taxes are due. You have to write the check by that date. So let's say somebody steps into 20 million in cap gains and want to put 10 million away. Well, they got to squirrel away 3 million to pay the tax or 6 million to pay the tax on the original cap gains and have to do that no later than December 31st, 2026, okay? What are some of the mechanisms in real estate deals that you've seen people plan for to be able to pay the taxes? So the there's a couple things here, and I'm, I'm going to go backwards on that, Mike, because I want to talk about everybody thinks this is absolutely a lock and load, a 10-year structure. It's not. It's not. But let's talk about year 10. And this is the most intriguing part. Like any investment, invest in what you know and invest in something that you think is going to appreciate the value. And this, to me, is the tax benefits are icing. This is the real value. So if you have a property that you put 10 million into day one, and in year 10 in a day, it's worth 20 million, you just picked up 11.5 million tax-free forever. So one and a half on the first 10 and that top 10. So think about that. What's the market gonna do? 11 year bull run in, in real estate, 11 year bull run in equities. There's a chance it's gonna go down sometime, I don't know, next year, five years from now, who knows? Do you want to get caught on the bottom, or do you want to take some of your cap gains off the table, not all of them, take some off the table, and put it away as a 10-year annuity, okay? You're not going to look at that money for 10 years. All right, now let's go backwards, because I think, to Mike's point, a lot of people, yes, sir? If you sell, in your example, before you get to 10 years, if you sell and you have to pay the tax on the original cap gain, and you did a, a real estate project, can you put that sale into 1031 and therefore defer paying the tax? After the sale? Yeah. Can yeah. You so the so, sale so let, me, let me go back there. Let's just say you do that in year nine. You still have absorbed the 10% benefit, the 15% benefit in terms of the reduction in cap gains tax. And in year nine, it's worth 2x. So your 10 million is now worth 20. You want to roll it into a 1031 and defer longer. As the rule is written right now, you can. And this is one of the things that they're gonna... Or another opportunity zone, probably. Yes, or another opportunity. And that's, that's what I wanna talk. Everybody's like, wow, 10 years. So anybody invest in private equity or hedge funds here? Okay, five to seven year hold. Okay, sometimes three year on the hedge fund. You, you, you can't get your money out for a minimum of a year, what have you. Yes, sir. So you're saying that if you sell in year nine, you're able to defer the first capital gain? If you put it in a 1031. But you will not see, you'll have to pay whenever you pull that money out of the 1031 in the future, a couple, couple significant changes. So again, I'm using that 10 million number. 
you go on past year seven, so you're only going to pay cap gains in the first eight five. Now your ten is worth twenty, but it's year nine, not year ten in a day. You're going to have to pay cap gains on that top ten. Okay, at a time. In the future, if you roll that twenty into a ten thirty one in year nine, you could defer. But when it comes out, the basis is increased. So if twenty is now worth forty, thirty years, you're paying cap gains on the forty. Yeah, but we're talking about so there's a cap. Let's, let's say that there's a cap gain on the sale of stock. Yeah. Right? And now you you roll it into real estate. Yep. Now you're at year nine. You have to pay capital gains on the gain from the stock sale, or can you defer that a second time? If you exchange it into right now, as it's written, you can defer that, okay, through a 1031. Again, this is something that's going to get answered probably with the April update because there's lots of ways to play this. But but hold that thought. So we had some private equity investors, some hedge fund investors, and again, you're, what's what's the hold period here? Ten years. It's a little bit long. I don't know if my clients or I don't know if I want to go in for ten years. So not, I, uh, gentlemen, I answer your question in one minute. Go ahead. Equity is collateral. I'm sorry. Can you use the equity, let's say you have equity, your equity position at eight years, can you use that as You're product? figuring it out. You know, the short answer is yes, that's a great question. So you put in- listening to our dinner conversation. That's right, you put in 10 million bucks day one. Okay, this is something, people aren't aware of this, and this is fascinating to me. There's gonna be a whole cottage industry, regular traditional back, banking and, and, and off-market banking. You can borrow against the equity, that you, the cap gains that you just put in with QOZ. So you put 10 million bucks into this property, year one, I need seven, I want to roll it into something else. You can borrow against that. No tax consequence. You can borrow against it. You have to pay the note off, and whatever the terms that you negotiate they are, but no tax consequence. It does not affect your original $10 million investment, so you can borrow. So again, let's get back to Mike make a comment. This to me is a giant 401k on steroids. So I'm going to explain that to you. So real estate developers, somebody comes in in three years, we have another three year bull market, you know, tail end of the bull. Somebody comes in and offers you a price you can't refuse for a property that's in a QOZ. What are you gonna do? You're gonna sell it. You're gonna take the money. So you sell it for three X. Uh oh, I'm gonna have to pay cap gains on that. No, you're not. You got 180 days in year three to roll it into another QOZ fund or property. And then another 31 months to deploy all the capital, okay? So think about that. You could be in and out for 10 years, 80 times. You can move, if, again, if somebody offers you money that's too good to refuse, you gotta take the deal, roll it into another property. So people have to start thinking, everybody's hung up on the 10 year deal. It's not a 10 year deal. You need 10 years to get the appreciation value, but you can go in and out of different fund structures along the way. And again, this is something that's going to be worked out. They're talking about limiting it where you can do that, but the last fund you have to stay in for 10 full years. I think that's going to get squashed personally, but we'll see. We'll see what the rules and regs in April. Yes, sir. So at year 10, there's a step up in basis to whatever the market value is. Correct. If you, let's say you sell it at your eight, and, um, and the new the new investment is that another ten years or is it just go to twenty? So that that is where there's there's some debate over that exact question right now. The way it's written right now, it's just two more years. So your your hold period is the full ten. So the new investment would be two. But there's some so if you dialogue have, and discussion. If you have the investment of, for twenty years, at the ten year you have a step up basis. The next ten years is just like any other investment. Hold that thought. That's a, that's another great question. The law goes through two thousand forty seven. You can hold it for, what is that, 28 years from now? You can hold it that long. So it, after 10 years in a day, if 20 million goes to 50 million and you haven't pulled the funds, same treatment, step up on basis when you pull the trigger. So if you're, if you're, okay, so here's where I am with this, okay? If you're Warren Buffett, if you're Warren Buffett, you're shutting every business down that you own every real estate property and you're moving everything into a QOZ because he's a 30 to 50 year guy, mm -hmm. right? Long term hurdle. Why would you not do that? Yes. Well, Chris, what if you don't want to sell your, like let's say you have a property that's in Highland Park. Right. Business. Why not just sell it to another LLC that you have or is that a like kind of right. and then, Yes. And then take that stuff up in basis and take that money and... <laughs> Did somebody plant you here? You're asking some great, great questions. Okay, no, listen, so, th so this is, 
I'm, I am at the point of why is not everybody in business and in real estate in the U.S. thinking about this 100% of their day right now? Of course, some my Apple stock right now and buy it right there. It, well, you can't. It's not fine. It's got to be a tangible asset. So there's a little quirkiness to that. This, they're trying to prevent hedge funds and private equity from gaming us. So it's got to be single asset. 70% of the tangible assets have to be on the property in the business. But hold that thought. Okay? This is, this is what I said at a conference last week. Let's take Facebook. Zuckerberg probably owns 20% or less. If I'm Mark Zuckerberg, I'm shutting down Palo Alto. I'm building a $2 billion facility in a QOZ. I'm selling the entire company. I'm going to make it private. I'm still going to retain 51% voting shares. I'm taking my 20%. He can retain up to 19.99. I'm putting it in a QOZ and $50, $80 billion valuation today. If it's worth $200 billion in 11 years, they just picked up $120 billion tax-free forever. So you got to think about that. you got to get your arms around that. Why do, you th why, do you think, why do you think Amazon was going to where they were going in Queens? Why do you think they were going to Alexandria, Virginia? Right. Because they are. Businesses. They're both opportunities. But their profits aren't from the OCs, though. Well, Facebook, again, yeah, you, you have to define tangible assets, but even a U.S. business, if they're doing business overseas, they're domiciled here. They have to pay tax on what's generated. So it's 50% of the cash of the revenue has to be generated in the location that's in a QOZ, and 70% of the tangible assets have to be there. So in the Zuckerberg model, move all your servers, all your data, boom, build a huge hub. Everything runs from there globally. He qualifies. Yeah, I could get some smaller companies. So yeah, yeah so working, working with a, a small pharmaceutical company that's in Philadelphia, they're moving to Camden, New Jersey. They called me originally about an eight million dollar New Jersey grow tax credit they have. I said, that's great. Where are you going, Camden? What's the address? Pulled up the address, and that's in an opportunity zone. What's that? I said, hold the bus. So, so I said, you need to shut down that business and reform the business as a new LLC in a QOZ, as a QOZ bid. And she said, why? And they create, uh, they bought some patents from the University of Pennsylvania. They do pediatric medicine. So we're going to tour the site next week. And I said, as Julio's example earlier, they're going to buy a building, <clears throat> knock it down, build brand new. There's other credits and incentives that you can get. But let me talk to you about the QOZB benefits. She's like, what are you talking about? I said, okay, what's the valuation of your company right now? 50 million bucks. What's your, what's your goal? I want to sell to Pfizer or Merck or somebody in 10 years. Perfect. So you find that next drug, you're developing 50 on your location, 49 fail. But that one drug, that cures some form of pediatric cancer, Pfizer buys for $1 billion in 10 years. You just picked up $950 million tax-free forever. She's like, what are you talking about? I sent her back from KPMG and said, you got to get your arms around this. So anybody own office, office buildings here, invest in office. All right, so this is, uh, I was a developer on the retail side, but this, Office fascinates me. So we did a pitch to uh, a city that, I, as I joke, came in 84th in the running for Amazon HQ2. <laughs> but they did an unbelievable report, and, and it's a, a capital city, state capital. They did a report on what they have, and they've got 50 pharmaceutical hubs around them, 50 tech companies. I said, this is what you do. Two buildings, 10 stories each, one pharma, one tech, one floor each, 10 of the smartest people from 10 pharma companies, 10 of the smartest people developing product from tech companies, like put them in there, we works for pharma, we work for tech, and have them go. 100 products are being developed, 99 fail in each building. But that one is the next billion dollar product. You're in for 100 million each building, you charge them now, this is my real estate hat, below market rent, percent of EBITDA, percent of sale, 10% of the upside after 10 years. Okay, so people are like, wow, that's, that's crazy. I said, yeah, it is crazy. So maybe just do 20% of the building. So 70%, 80% of the building, get your law firms, your accounting firms, stable tenants that are gonna be there for long duration, cover your bills, your NOI, you take a flyer on that top two floors, that top 20%, and put in a WeWorks for tech, for tech WeWorks for farmer, something that has exponential growth. So just do the simple math. 
you're in for 1x real estate, you get a two and a half, three, you're great, right? You picked up one and a half to two points, two X tax free. What if you're in for a hundred X? You just picked up 99 X tax free forever. And again, I don't think people really are generally understanding this. They're starting to, there's some really smart people that are working <coughs> on this type of uh, structure. We're dealing with a firm out in Phoenix. One of their verticals is uh, venture capital. It's all they're doing. They're buying a building, they're putting 100 of their investments in the building and saying, go to work. It's no different, you're across the street from where you were before. You're in downtown Phoenix, go to work. Why don't you hit the cover off the ball and we'll sell it to Google in five years. John, what about okay. that gentleman that owns real estate? Where, where should he be running his all right, business? So here, here's real estate angle. Real estate business angle. Real estate business angle, again, if you own properties. Move your office, move your headquarters to a QOZ tomorrow. And here's why. So let's say you own 10 buildings, none are in QOZ. But you're looking at buying buildings in a QOZ. And your, your primary function, your bill collection, rent collection, what have you, your maintenance, your, all your CAM is coming from this location. You're basically managing the properties from a location that's in a QOZ. So the tangible asset test, you're not going to pass. But now you start to buy five and 10 properties that are in a QOZ. Okay, so now you're passing the tangible assets test. And clearly, at least 50% of your revenue was generated there. Now you can leverage, and the math is 43%, okay? I'm going to explain that to you, of the QOZ benefit. So you have 43% leverage opportunity just because 70% of your cash or tangible assets has to be in QOZ, which means 30% do not. So you could buy seven buildings. Yes, sir? For those of you, we normally cut off around 9 o'clock, but big but everybody seems to be really focused on what's going on. If you feel like you need to leave, don't hesitate to get up and leave. Go your bed. I'm going to let you go as yeah, long go. as you want. I have 13 brothers and sisters, so once I get a microphone, it's hard to take it away from <laughs> <laughs> I had to fight, fight for the microphone my whole life. I live in a house, my dad used to say, we were in an old folks' home and an orphanage, but a lot since we were the one. So I'm just kidding. Yeah. But, but I wanted to give people, feel like you permission to get up if you want to leave. But there's so much good information, too. I want to let you keep going, okay? Great. So just keep moving along. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. So, so think about that. Think about 43% leverage of QOZ benefit on non QOZ property. We're business. So you have seven locations inside QOZ, three that are not, but you're using cap gains to fund those three, you still get the same treatment. Okay, the five, the seven, the ten year treatment. So think about that. You don't have to run everything in a QOZ, just 70% of the tangible assets, 50% of the revenue. What are, what are the opportunity zone projects that you have ready to go right now for in, in the, on the demand side, someone has cap yeah. gain? Yeah, so just to give you an idea, and I'm just going to run through a list, uh, Julio, Mike, and I uh, have looked at over 150 different deals. We've narrowed it down to about 15. Uh, top three right now, we've got a luxury townhouse development, world-class developer in San Antonio, 24-story townhouse, two blocks from the wall. Again, they got lucky. The property was designated QOZ after they bought it. So they have to sell the property and keep 20% of, of, of the land but they can keep 100% of the QOZ benefit in the structure up top. We've got a hotel in St. Petersburg, Florida, Marriott brand. It's three quarters of the way done. Somebody needs to buy it with cap gains. It's gonna start cash flowing in six months, okay? We've got a multifamily in Tampa. Yeah, hold that thought, this is very interesting. So we've got a uh, multifamily in Tampa. Again, 30 million bucks. So we need 80, we could deploy $200 million tomorrow. So we're actively raising for three separate single asset funds, 30 million, 30 million, 20. We have a professional sports franchise. And this blows me away. Again, Jerry Jones should be all over this. Buy this sports franchise in a QOZ, build the stadium in a QOZ, and the valuation of the team goes from 500 million to 3 billion. In 20 years, he just picked up two and a half billion tax break. Okay, so we have a stadium development, which multifamily hotel, et cetera, around it. We have um, 
a coffee business. And again, this gets me to the 70-30 rule or 43% leverage on your QOZ. They have 12 high-end coffee retail outlets in Florida. They're putting their roasting facility in a QOZ. And I was trying to do the math, and that, that's probably not going to work. We distribute all of the product to the, to the uh, non-QOZ properties. But here's the catch. They also distribute through uh, a food and beverage distributor nationally into hotels. So yes, 70%, 50% of the revenue is coming from this location. Still debate on whether they're going to pass the 70% test. But some of those properties we're looking right now might exist in the QOZ. And if not, we said, build your next five there. Get over that threshold. Then you, you're hitting the 70-30 rule. And your goal, again, so Starbucks comes in and buys in year 11 for 5X, you just picked up 4X tax-free. So again, it's, it's getting businesses and real estate owners, operators to just think a little bit differently. And I, I strongly encourage everybody to talk to your accounting team, talk to your lawyer, figure this out. We provide end-to-end -end QOZ in a box, again, partnering with accounting firms that are local and specialists, down to fund management services, down to disposition at the end. So, yes, sir. All right, so we're a retailer also, so we can we 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 lease right now our locations. Okay. So lease lease counts. Okay, so we lease in in, in a QOZ a zone. Yep. Um, you know that's a that's one store. Right. Right. So you get you know, but the corporation somewhere else. So how does so, how does, what do we have? Fifty percent in QOZ in. in zone and 50% not or 70% in and 30% in? It's, it's got to be 70 30. So 70% of your tangible assets have to be in a QOZ in order to qualify, but only 50% of the revenue. Okay. Okay, so, so we have 50% of our revenue coming from opportunity zones, then we get treatment, full treatment? Full treatment on the whole 100%. Okay. Yes, sir. And put them, put them in the QOZ after your incubator. Your incubator, if it's in a QOZ, is it? Yeah. And if it's not moving there tomorrow, and when they, they're ready to grow up and, and leave the nest, put them in a QOZ. <coughs> so then your investment, yes, just for, just for the 10 year duration. So your investment now, they're gonna outgrow you, that's tech startup 101, right? Yeah. Two or three years, management team, you give them capital, human capital, financial capital, you steer them down the right path, and then they go off on their own. Before your next deal, mandate, if they go off on their own, they're going into a QOZ. That's it. Non-negotiable. And they're not hard to find. They're in really nice areas. Yes, sir. Uh, I and I, you have done a lot of one-off for private wealth individuals in the offices, and we are putting together a third fund, our second fund with Starwood, for about 700 million. Our biggest concern on both ends is after this year, the 10 year goes away, and then 180 days to get all the capital invested, not just allocated, but invested. Do you see any tax code coming that's going to alleviate either, either of those two concerns? 10 year stays, seven year goes away, because it'll be seven years, January 1st will be less than seven years to December 31st, 2026. The so 10 year stays <laughs> up until December 31st, 2026. So you can create a fund and just not get the, the, the 10 and the five step up in basis. Five and seven? Okay. Uh, the 10 percent, five percent, five and seven. Yeah. Okay. But that's the will stay regardless through 26. Correct. As long as you go 26, you get that full. Correct. John, so is, it, the is, that. is that that slide answering that, that question? Yeah, yeah. And by the way, this is very conservative. We're hearing uh, that this, this is adding 300 to, 50, to 500 basis points to a 10 percent investment. And again, it increases as the returns increase. So 20 is probably adding seven to eight. Yes, sir. So you had a map up there. I think it may have answered uh, where I was going to go with my question. We haven't really talked about these QOZs in particular. Is there any rip? Who, who's who's um, figuring it out or identifying okay. the QOZ in the federal government? Yeah, tell yes. us. So and, and is there any risk? that I put an asset there 
and it and changes. In years, it's not QZ. Right. So, um, very, very good questions. So, again, as, as Julio stated, uh, Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina, Senator Cory Booker led this insertion of this at the, at the end. Again, two guys that don't agree on anything politically, they agreed on this. And the original intent was we've got to help, as, as Jack Kemp Enterprise Zones, we've got to help economically deprived areas and stimulate them. And by the way, uh, what's the guy's name? Scott Parker, uh, Napster founder, Facebook investor. He came up with the idea. It was his idea. Okay? So this is what happened. Each state received, this is based on the 2010 census tract, so it's very interesting, and I tell people, every state is different how they handled it. So they picked um, 20,000 low income census tracts based on the 2010 uh, census. Well, that was the height of the recession. Okay, so there's a couple peculiarities that came out of that. So, which I'll explain, but the governors of each state had 30 days to pick their allotment of those census tracts. So some did it very strategically, where they said, you know what, we want to grow in Tahoe or Reno, Nevada, we want to get away just be in a casino business, whatever. Or, hey, we have a ton of open land in, in southeastern, you know, Colorado, so let's see if, if that, that's one of the areas, let's pick that. Um, some states were not as progressive or smart, and uh, Philadelphia being a city that's generally 20 years behind everything. So as I said, there, there's, uh, there's an area in North Philadelphia, right by Temple University, which we affectionately call the Badlands. It's called the Badlands because it's really, really bad. Guess what? It's now in QOZ. I wouldn't put a penny in the Badlands for the next 100 years, okay? Because it's just, it's not going to work. It, it, it's a really bad area, and it's not going to work. However, Camden, New Jersey, which was awful 20 years ago, is seeing this renaissance pre-QOC. And the Sixers moved the facility over there. A lot of the farmers moved headquarters over there because of credits and incentives they were getting from the state of New Jersey. So each state is different on how they portion these. Some just, literally, you can see, they just, okay, yep. Some of it was political. There's, there's an example. That's, that's Atlanta. Right. Um, Right. There's Charlotte, just because I live in Charlotte. So, I mean, it amazes me if you know Charlotte. It's, it's all around the airport. All, I mean, it's it's yeah. growing areas. It's 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 unbelievable. You know, again, I made the comment about you know, why why was Amazon going where they're going? Well, because that's <laughs> that that's the whole area. You know, where Amazon was going to be in, going to be in New York. That's that's where they're going in in uh, in Washington D.C. or Virginia. Um, is there an interactive map? There's an interactive map. You can literally plug in a street address, any state, and it will pull it up. Yeah, I mean, you, you can. Yeah, we have it in the presentation, a bunch of different uh, resource links. It's also on our website. We have a whole page of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you just, if you just Google uh, uh, map for, for Dallas, it, 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 you'll find it. 